Well, it's great being here in Philadelphia, seeing old friends like Barbara Rocky, Alice Hoffman. Alice taught me at Penn State in the 70s, and it's just wonderful to reconnect with these uh, friends of mine from the labor movement. I saw Jimi Hendrix and Santana together at the electric factory in the 70s. <laughs> saw a lot of Grateful Dead concerts at the Spectrum. Yeah, Philly was the place to go if you're from Harrisburg. <laughs> which is where I lived for a while, where I went to high school. Still is, huh? Well, so it is great to be here. Uh, we just had a great meeting with a bunch of Philadelphia labor leaders, uh, and it's great to be in this expanded crowd. You know, the, John said that on the labor environmental nexus is something that's been near and dear to my heart for quite a while. Uh, it really has been since the 50s. I grew up along the banks of Lake Erie in the 50s and early 60s. Um, I, you from that area? All right. So <clears throat> I was there and swam in the lake and ate the yellow perch, hundreds of them, thousands probably, um, until they posted the signs that said, don't eat the fish, don't swim in the lake. Until that happened, which was the mid-60s, um, we just saw the, the smoke coming out of the steel mills where my father worked um, as, you know, food on the table. We didn't think that much about it. Uh, but those were sort of wake-up calls. I family migrated to central Pennsylvania. I went to work in an aluminum mill. And then Hurricane Agnes hit in the uh, early 70s, wiped out my mill, and I went to work with the laborers union doing heavy and highway construction. One of those projects that I worked on, uh, paid my way through Penn State, was the construction of the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant outside of Harrisburg. And I was on the concrete crew. Every day I went to work, I crossed a picket line of environmental organizations that didn't want to see the power plant built. My local union had a bumper sticker said, hungry and out of work, eat an environmentalist. I was laborers local 158. And I objected to that bumper sticker. I didn't get very far in the local with my objections, uh, but I made the case that these folks have a point. The point being, aside from the dangers of nuclear power, the plant was not designed to withstand the impact of a Boeing 707, the largest jet at that time. And as many of you may know, that power plant sits on an island in the Susquehanna River right next to the Harrisburg Airport. So they had a good point on, on that level as well. So as I went through my trade union work, I was always focused on the environment and labor and how to strengthen those ties and create a common vision. Uh, so when the United Nations finally decided in 88, 1988 to form their first commission on global warming. Uh, I went to the leadership of the industrial union department where I worked and said, we should get on that commission. And they agreed with me and said, you should get on that commission. So they nominated me and I did and served on the UN commission for global warming for about 15 years. And that was quite a uh, and education. And the reason I say when the UN finally decided to do that, I say that because articles about global warming were appearing in scientific journals in the early 1900s. The first publicly available article about global warming appeared in Scientific American magazine in 1959. Hearings were held through the late 70s and early 80s on global warming. So we were already late in the game when the UN finally set up its commission. Uh, and here we are, 30 years later, having accomplished very little, if anything. The international process has failed us. Our national political process has failed us. And we're now, with decades of ignoring the problem, at the precipice of massive damage due to carbon emissions, human activity, and we've known about it. Uh, so I, I say that to put 
some of my comments in a perspective uh, because it's now really urgent that we do something about this problem. Uh, we don't have the luxury of um, you know, measured approaches, slow, careful approaches. We had that chance 30 years ago. We blew it. So now we need dramatic action to reduce carbon in the atmosphere. So I talk a lot about global warming, which is simply the warming of the earth by the, us emitting carbon, which stops heat from the sun from going back out into space. It keeps it like a blanket over the earth and is warming the earth. We've now warmed the planet by over one degree Celsius, by one degree Celsius, which is one and a half or a little more than that Fahrenheit. We've done that much damage and we're seeing in real time what that is causing. Forest fire seasons that don't have seasons anymore. They're year round. That's global warming. Plant closings in Texas of meatpacking facilities because they can't raise cattle anymore due to drought. So drought and forest fires, famine in other parts of the world causing wars, strong storms. A couple years ago, we had a year with 11 $1 billion weather events. Normally we have one or two. We had 11, I think it was 2010. So in a way, the Earth is waging its own public relations campaign about global warming. And it's working. People are now starting to listen and think about solutions. What we say at the Labor Network for Sustainability, a couple things, but one is that climate change is the real job killer. Not the answers to climate change. We oppose the Keystone Pipeline because it is a pipeline to one of the largest sources of the dirtiest, it's not even oil, it's bitumen, it's like a tar type substance on the planet in Alberta, Canada. We want to transport it to the Gulf, ship it around the world to be burned. Big mistake. So we oppose that and are labeled job killers because there, there will be people needed to build the pipeline couple thousand of them, and I honor those jobs. You'll never hear me say anything denigrating the work done by a laborer or a pipe fitter or an operating engineer who's trying to feed their families. But that doesn't mean that we have to support jobs that destroy the planet. It's a tough position that the labor movement is now in. There's a lot of environmentalists in the room, and I want you to think about this. The reason people pay dues to unions is to have their jobs protected today. That's why they pay dues. So as trade union leaders, we have a legal and moral responsibility to do that, to protect the jobs today. But we also have a responsibility to look to the future. And I quote often, a leader of the CIO, president of the CIO, president of the Auto Workers Union, Walter Ruther, who used to talk about this dynamic in this way. He would say that what we're about as a labor movement is the problems we face on the shop floor every morning. But to make that the sole point is to miss the target. Because what good is an extra week's vacation we negotiate if the lake we take our kids to is polluted and they can't swim in it? What good is an extra hundred dollars in pension if the world goes up in atomic smoke? And I'm quoting him from a speech in 1962. And he would go on and on and link our shop floor gains with broader social issues. He was a visionary. And it's a vision that we need more in the labor movement today. So, Making a living on a living planet is our tagline. If you go to the website of the Labor Network for Sustainability, you'll see making a living on a living planet. And that symbolizes what we're about. We're about addressing income inequality and jobs. 
and the climate crisis and the sustainability crisis, which is a little broader, we believe that we can do both. We can fix both those huge crises with the same set of policies. And that's what we work on. We are right now unlucky in the extreme because we know we have to leave in the ground three quarters of all the fossil fuels that are out there. We know that. Science has been telling us that for some time. So here's the very substance that has built our society, our lives, provided the heat and the air conditioning and the automobiles and all the things we rely on. And we know we have to now leave it in the ground and find other sources of energy. That's a drag. But that is the fact. That's the science, and it's crystal clear. So what I say to my trade union brothers and sisters is that we need to step up to the plate and have a climate program of our own. Right now, the labor movement doesn't have an answer to the climate crisis. And we need to develop one. And what I say to my friends in the environmental movement is that you should have a jobs program of your own. And here's why. Because you are viewed, legitimately so, as being tone deaf when it comes to the issues working people face every day. And that will hold us back from the gains we need to address the climate crisis. People ask me all the time, how come in Germany, a country with the climate of the Pacific Northwest, they don't get a lot of sun, how is it that they've been able to transition to solar in such a big way and wind? With union support, and my answer is simple, no worker in Germany ever worries about health care. No worker in Germany has to worry about pension. No worker in Germany is worried about how they're going to educate their kids. And no worker in Germany is fretting over paid vacation. They get it all by public policy. So here, what holds working people in America back on some of these issues is fear. Because they don't know how they're going to meet those needs every day. That fear holds us back. So we need big answers to big problems. And it's going to take a big role uh, of the federal government to address this stuff. I'm going to get into that in a minute. So why should the labor and environmental movement work together? Uh, I'm, I'm answering some questions that John posed to me as some things you might want to address. And John, you're keeping time, right? And you'll tell me when I have like five minutes left. And I understand I could be approaching that point right now, but, um, <laughs> but I, need, I need the reminder, so thank you. Um, now I forgot what I was just about to say, but I, so who can remind me? Yes, yes, questions John posed. Why? Well, here's my answer. I'm not sure that we should, and I view that sort of approach to silo politics as the politics that has to be changed. We've always, and, and silo politics has served us well. You know, where we, labor does the jobs thing, environmentalists do sustainability and climate, and sometimes we come up out of our silo, shake hands, and we work together on something and accomplish great things. Climate change changes everything. Everything about how we organize our society, everything about how we do our politics, and everything about how we as trade unionists view our role in society, I believe. It changes everything. So we have to go from this toss salad approach to politics, I'm quoting my friend Larry Cohen, president of the CWA, uh, from that to a smoothie. It's not that we need to just work together on things, we need a common vision we need to develop a common vision. And that's why I say to environmentalists, get a jobs program of your own. I'll help you do it. And to labor people, let's develop an answer to the climate crisis. We can do that. Right now, neither movement is, is really changing a little bit. We need to push that. So I ask for all of your help 
because both movements have a ways to go to get past the dynamic of being tone deaf to each other's concerns, which has held us back in the past. So that's one reason that we should work together, but even go beyond that. If we look at the 40-year history of labor environmental engagement, and in another couple weeks you'll be able to go to our website and see a timeline on the website that starts with Earth Day and comes to the present with about 250 events over those four decades, both good and bad, of labor and environmental groups working together. And I was reviewing it the other day, and I saw where we worked together and passed the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. Labor was supportive of those measures. Environmentalists supported the creation of OSHA. And all of these things happened in, right around the same time, shortly after Earth Day. The first Earth Day would never have happened without the financial and organizational support of the UAW and AFSCME. It wouldn't have happened. And I get that from Dennis Hayes, who was the coordinator of the first Earth Day. So we've had a good history, but if we step back and think about it, we still have dirty air, and we still have dirty water. And one of the points I made at the dinner an hour ago was that fracking was exempted from the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act by President Bush, and we haven't reversed that. So we have this process that's extremely damaging to public health, to water, and to air, and that's emitting methane, which is 25 times more powerful a greenhouse gas than carbon, and it's exempt from regulation by the EPA because it's not covered under the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. So what are we doing now? Well, the Blue-Green Alliance has formed. It's a big coalition of labor and environmental organizations. They're doing great work. The Labor Network for Sustainability is formed. We're not a coalition of organizations. Organizations can't join us. Only people can. We're a network of individuals. We have 7,000 members. And what we're doing is working real hard to focus on the timeline that science tells us we're looking at and then to filter our policies through that timeline. So it's a very urgent kind of work. And we wanted it to be urgent, which is why we didn't want it to be a coalition of organizations. <laughs> right? I mean, it's the nature of coalitions that you kind of come to the lowest common denominator dynamic. And I don't say that in a derogatory sense. Uh, the industrial division of the AFL-CIO was a coalition of unions. So I'm real familiar with that dynamic, and I honor it. But we wanted something a little bit different. So we founded it as a network of individuals. Go to our website. There's a lot of great information about all these issues. There are other things going on today all over the country. Before we founded the Labor Network for Sustainability, we did a power structure analysis of the American labor movement. Nobody had ever done one that I could find. I looked far and wide. And we spent a full year with a team of three people we analyzed 42 labor organizations through a lens of sustainability and decided, based on who they represent, what they stand to gain or lose in this path to a sustainable future. So that's a self-interest analysis. We then did a decision-maker analysis. We identified the top 800 movers and shakers in the labor movement around the country, and we did bios on half of them. That's a lot of work, and it was fascinating. The results were amazing. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. And then we did an analysis of how labor changes on big social issues. We went back to civil rights in the 50s and 60s. We looked at globalization, single-payer health care, war, immigration, all issues where the American labor movement transitioned from a conservative posture to a more progressive posture and we identified the strategies change agents within the labor movement adopted to help bring about those changes. And all of those things fed the creation of the Labor Network for Sustainability. Now, I went around, I said that I was Secretary-Treasurer of the Industrial Division, or John did. Um, 
I left the AFL-CIO in 2005 to work on climate change. The first thing I did was go and meet with union presidents one-on-one -on -one about the issue. I met with 20. It took me about a year, year and a half. I'm doing it all on my own. It was a fascinating process. And this gets to the decision maker analysis, the 800 movers and shakers, the bios we did. So I go to one friend of mine, Harold Schaeberger, president of the Firefighters Union, and I said, I want to meet with you about climate change. He said, Joe, you're wasting your time. I don't care about it. And it's not an issue for my union. He said, I'm happy to meet with you, but not about that. So when we did the decision maker analysis, we found two vice presidents of his union, members of the board of directors of the firefighters, who care so much about it that they have their own websites about firefighters and climate change. And that's symbolic of what we found all across the country of labor leaders at local and regional levels engaging with environmental issues, having the tough conversations, and doing the work where the national leadership didn't quite know about it, or if they did, they were ignoring it. So that's another part of what led us to set up the Labor Network for Sustainability structured the way we did. We want to help light those fires, um, initiate if needed, or help advance if not the conversations between our two movements that will lead to the, the smoothie politics uh, that I mentioned earlier. We focus on some key industries, ones that are in transition, and this is important because I talk a lot about just transition, a concept I learned about from Tony Mizaki at the OCAW. The reality is we've never as a nation done just transition right, never. The only big example we have was trade adjustment assistance, which was a disaster. It took six years for the first worker to get qualified under that law. The hurdles were so bizarre. We've never done it right, and we have to do it right now because of the transitions we're facing in energy. We know that, but not just energy. Our entire utility system is going to look very different in 15 years than it does today. It's going to be completely reorganized. And I say that with the full knowledge of how corrupt and corporate controlled it is. And the PUCs, Public Utility Commissions, corrupt and corporate controlled, we're going to have to reorganize that entire system. So energy, um, food. It's hard to imagine a nation with as abundant a food supply as ours that manages it more poorly than we do. That system is going to go through major transformation. Health and health care are areas that are going to go through transitions. Okay, thank you. And there are other industries as well. I'm going to name one that we've missed completely. And if you think about a sustainable future, you'll wonder why I'm talking about this. Keep in mind what a sustainable future looks like. Twenty years ago, the state of California passed a law that said caregivers and patients could cooperatively cultivate the marijuana plant. That's in the law, co-ops, in the law. Today, it's a billion dollar industry in California alone. A billion dollar industry. One union, the United Food and Commercial Workers, is catching on. They now have a cannabis division in the union, and they have a website, Cannabis Workers Rising. <laughs> I know, but, but think about, rather, I, I, you know, I get the jokes, I, and I love to participate in them, but let me tell you this, the justice issues are clear. I've read the Nixon memos from the early 70s when they created the war on drugs. You know what he had in mind? Putting people of color in jail and taking away their right to vote, and he did it, and we let him do it, the justice issues. The economics are clear. We're looking at a hundred billion dollar industry nationwide, maybe more when you include hemp and marijuana. So the economics are clear. The politics are clear. Marijuana got more votes than Obama in Colorado. It did. Got more votes. 
the health issues, the science, crystal clear, with the discovery of the endocannabinoid system in the human body, if you don't know about it, Google and read about it, we have a receptor system in our body designed to receive the 80 cannabinoids in the plant, the active ingredients of the plant. You only know about the one, THC, because it gets you high, but there are 79 others that do all kinds of other things, so the science is clear. Everything is clear about legalizing. We have allowed the politics of hate and the right wing to demonize a plant that is a gift to humanity. Shame on us. And I raise this one not just because I think marijuana should be legalized, but because it's an example of an industry that we've missed. We, I'm talking labor. You know, now some of the you know, UFCW is catching on. But all these other transitions, they're going to happen whether we like it or not, just like marijuana. And we need to be on the front end of those changes, not the back end. Labor can lead on climate change. Labor people don't think that. They think that's up to the environmentalists. It's not an environmental issue. Climate change is a human issue. It's a justice issue. It's an existential issue. Just like, just like, do you agree with that or, or not? Well, we'll have questions, so it's okay if you do. Just like when Walter Ruther, before we were involved in World War II, he said, he was the first one to do it, we need to stop the production of automobiles. The president of the Auto Workers Union and put all our emphasis on tanks and planes and let's win this war. That was the head of the union. Labor can lead on climate. And here's how they can do it. By taking the income inequality issue, the climate crisis, combining them and develop a program, a national program, just like what we had to end the depression, to win World War II, to build the US highway system, to put a man on the moon, national program, marshal national resources and corporate resources, and win the climate crisis and the income inequality crisis. And I see the labor movement as being in a unique position to lead on that challenge. There has to be a just transition. Now, it's not going to be easy. And it's going to get harder before it gets easier inside the labor movement. Right now, there's a big battle going on. And what I call the, the self-appointed arbiters of trade unionism, which are some of my own friends in the union, I'm, one of the unions I'm out of, the laborers, like to, like to call those of us who oppose the Keystone Pipeline, and I've been arrested twice at the White House, opposing that pipeline, so-called trade unionists. They don't believe you can be a trade unionist if you oppose that pipeline or oppose fracking. So there's a struggle, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. And that's why I like to talk about the CIO vision of trade unionism. My parents were both CIO organizers. And they always called CIO not Congress of Industrial Organization, which we know it to be, Nobody else does, but those of us who are in that part of the labor movement knows what it stands for. My parents defined it as community in operation. And that was their vision of a labor movement. And that's what I think we need to get back to. So dual crisis, income inequality and jobs, climate crisis, solved with the same set of policies, making a living on a living planet. Thank you.